on YouTube, there are of course many videos about the lore of the Grand Theft Auto games, and unfortunately, many of them are complete nonsense. Undoubtedly, some of these are made by people who know they're false. Hey, if I create some sensational bullshit, people will click and give me views and money. Others are made by people who just don't know anything. I don't really care that they don't know anything. It's just like, well, this is popular. Let's make a video about it. Frank, you played GTA like seven years ago, right? What, you got like half an hour in? Ah, it's enough lore analysis. Let's make a video. We should, of course, expect for this phenomenon to happen for GTA 6. And even with only one trailer out, it is already beginning. The Game Theorist just released a video titled Game Theory. GTA 6 spoiled its entire story in the trailer. Now, obviously, that's just sensational garbage, and the video's quality reflects that. But unfortunately, I can't tell you how incorrect they are about GTA 6's story. After all, the game hasn't released yet. But within this video, the game theorists make a summary of GTA 5's story, a game that came out 10 years ago. And what's funny is they get the entire thing wrong. Imagine making a video where you imply that you're so knowledgeable in lore analysis that just from a trailer you can tell the entire story, and yet miss the details of a story that released 10 years ago. This summary occurs during a section where they talk about how Rockstar used uses particular songs in their trailers to communicate certain things about the story of the game. Rockstar also has themselves a habit of taking the use of music one step further. They tend to use songs with specific lyrics to hint at what their story is going to be about, with the second trailer using the song Skeletons by Stevie Wonder. Quote again, Skeletons in your closet itching to come outside. GTA 5 was all about Michael lying about who he was. His friends thought he was dead, but instead he'd made a deal with the FBI and went into witness protection. And when the song goes on to say she said it wasn't polite to tell a white one, he said one white lie turns into a black one. It's all about how Michael omitted the truth, telling small white lies to the people around him, which continued to grow into bigger and bigger lies. Black lies. Leading to massive altercations, and depending on the ending you chose, the ending of one of the characters' lives. Amongst all that nonsense, obviously the falsehood that stands out the most is that Michael did a deal with the FBI to go into witness protection. Imagine knowing so little about the game that you're covering that you don't even know the agency's name, the FIB. What's most bothersome about people not understanding this part the story, isn't that the entire story doesn't make sense if Michael is in the witness protection program? It's that Lester at the very beginning of the game explains that this isn't the case. While there's endless bits of evidence that showcases that this is just a lie that he tells Trevor, this conversation alone should be enough for you to understand that he isn't actually in the witness protection program. Your FIB buddies, they uh, know you're back in business? FIB buddies? What are you talking about? I checked out the WPP thing. Doesn't look like any WITSEC program I'm aware of. Well, for starters, they, uh, they don't put witnesses up in multi-million dollar mansions in Rockford Hills. Oh, maybe they thought this would be the best cover. And most witnesses don't transfer five-figure sums into a particular FIB agent's bank account every month. Of course, the money gets moved around and washed through a number of fronts, but the trail is there. Deposits and withdrawals the same sum every month. Agent Dave Norton, white middle-aged divorcee, unremarkable career, except for one incident, the shooting of a notorious stick-up man, Michael yeah, Townley. Yeah, 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 all right. Lester, I'm very impressed. The Witness Protection Program is a tool used by law enforcement to protect people so they can come forward and give evidence so justice can be done. Does anything that happened in North Yankton or Michael's circumstances at the beginning of the game suggest justice was done? Michael made a deal with one specific corrupt FIB agent, that being Dave Norton. Their goal, rather than achieving justice, was specifically to prevent it from occurring. Michael, by that point in his career, had done every crime under the sun multiple times. There was no legitimate deal that wouldn't see him behind bars for the rest of his life. And there's certainly no deal that would see him in a mansion in one of the best cities in the world with millions of dollars in his bank account. When Dave helped Michael fake his death, the idea was for everyone to think Michael was dead, including law enforcement. Michael's role in the agreement was to set things up so Dave could swoop in and save the day, taking down Michael Townley and ending the trio. The FIB would therefore be very impressed and say, well done, good job, Dave, here's a promotion, which is what happened. As far as the FIB was concerned, Michael was actually dead and Dave did kill him. Michael rightly summarizes this deal as he gets the glory and I get out. It was the threat of this deal coming to light and more people learning that Michael was alive that inspired a lot of what happens to Michael in the game. Dave says, Michael, you have to help me or else people go through my files and find out you're still alive and you'll be in prison for the rest of your life. Steve does go through Dave's files and finds out about their deal and that Michael's still alive. So he says to Michael, hey man, you want to do exactly what I say or else I'm going to tell everyone that you're still alive? When we break into the FIB building, one of the things we do in there is delete all the files on Michael that will tell people that he's still alive. A big part of the reason we kill Steve on ending C is because he can't be trusted to keep the secret that Michael is still alive. Literally, the entire story doesn't make sense if Michael is actually in witness protection. The only time Michael directly says he's in witness protection is when Trevor's standing across from him looking like he's about to kill Michael and his family. And Michael's like, 
Bro, I'm in witness protection, I swear. Please don't kill me and my family. Dave and Michael on By the Book literally discuss the lie that they've told Trevor. When he's away from Trevor, the closest that Michael gets to calling it a witness protection program is when he's speaking to Franklin. So I had to go into kind of a, an informal witness protection program. Because Dave did use his resources at the FIB to give Michael a new life and protect him. It just wasn't an on the books witness protection deal designed to bring forth justice. It was a misuse of government resources to subvert justice. A deal with a particular corrupt FIB agent that was protecting him rather than a deal with the FIB as a whole. Look, I am being intentionally brief because this topic has been done to death, including by me over the last few years. But the story of GT5 must be insanely confusing for anyone who actually thinks that Michael is in the witness protection program. Because the vast majority of things that happen to him, or that he does, happen because he isn't in the witness protection program. GTA 5 was all about Michael lying about who he was. His friends thought he was dead. One of the reasons why Michael wanted to get out of the game and why he's always so miserable is he doesn't really have any friends. Trevor talks about their time when they were doing heists and Trevor outright says that Michael refused to make friends or have any contacts. They would go to some place, be there very briefly, do a heist and then immediately jump somewhere else. Always on the move, never having roots, never making true friends. Consequently, it doesn't take long to look at the short list of associations Michael had, but when you look at them, it's clear that no, Michael didn't have friends that thought he was dead. He had his family, who were well aware what he did for a living and were well aware that he was alive. He had Lester, who was kind of a friend, but I guess more of a business associate, but even he knew Michael was still alive. He had Dave that at best he had like maybe a begrudging friendship with, but of course Dave knew that Michael was alive because he's the one who did the deal with him. There was Brad, but Michael never liked Brad. They were never friends and Brad died, so he didn't think Michael was dead. Then last Lastly, there's Trevor, but like, were they really friends at the end? Trevor was a crazy killer who would just kill a person in broad daylight, causing them to have to flee to another town. Michael was terrified of Trevor. There had to have been some measure of friendship at some point during their time running together, but when Michael made his deal with Dave, Dave was meant to kill Trevor. Traditionally, friends do not try to kill each other. Even on Trevor's side, Trevor's perfectly willing to admit that prior to Michael's death, he was considering cutting Michael off. He was considering ending the partnership and no longer running with him. He thought that Michael had lost his edge. Trevor was gonna do crimes with Brad instead. You can certainly say that Trevor considered Michael a friend. Whether Michael returned those feelings at the time of the Ludendorff heist, uh, maybe, possibly, but then you could consider there to be exactly one friend who Michael had that thought he was dead. Basically, Michael faking his death had nothing to do with convincing his friends that he was dead. It was all about convincing the wider world that he was dead. It was to convince law enforcement that he's dead, so there's no reason to look for him. It was to convince the wider criminal underworld that he was dead, so there's no reason to look for him. These were the groups he was trying to fool. And when the song goes on to say, she said it wasn't polite to tell a white one, he said one white lie turns into a black one. It's all about how Michael omitted the truth, telling small white lies to the people around him, which continued to grow into bigger and bigger lies. Black lies, leading to massive altercations, and depending on the ending you chose, the ending of one of the character's lives. Going with the premise that these lines are actually about Michael's story, no, I don't think that's a valid interpretation. The white lines likely refer to Michael's long criminal career. He had multiple identities, was of course jumping from place to place, using different names, telling lies to maintain himself for a short time before having to jump somewhere else. Maintaining false identities, maintaining a criminal career requires a lot of small lies to a lot of different people who don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But all these white lies to all these inconsequential people to maintain this criminal career led to one really big lie, which was his faking his death and making the corrupt deal with Dave. So all these small white lies led to one big black lie, but this happened all before the game even started. The game isn't about Michael continuously lying to the people around him. He didn't have a lot of people around him. In fact, if you look at Michael's interactions with everyone, he's pretty honest with everyone except Trevor in regards to that one big black lie. The game is less about Michael lying throughout the game causing things to happen, and more that a big black lie that he has from back in the day is causing him problems now. He's facing the consequences of those lies from back in the day. A significant portion of what he does in the game is all about protecting that one lie and everyone in the story who forces Michael to do stuff is already in on that lie to some degree. Like the altercations that happen in the game aren't because Michael continuously tells small white lies building into black lies, it is that he is protecting that one black lie that he told a long time ago. It isn't even as if he's telling more lies to protect that previous lie. He's not, he's doing crimes to protect that lie certainly, but he's not telling more lies. Like I sincerely don't know how you could play through GTA 5 and see it as Michael making all these small white lies that build into big black lies that cause the events that we play through in the game. I have no idea how you could come to that conclusion. Michael doesn't exactly lie to Franklin. If anything, he's pretty open and honest about how unhappy he is with his life. Michael's lies with Amanda had already ruined their relationship. There was no more lying there. They were open about how much they didn't like each other. Michael's family as a whole knows how much of a scumbag he is. They mock him for it. Lester call onto Michael's lies immediately, so Michael and Lester are completely straight with each other throughout the game. Dave, of course, is also in on Michael's previous lies. When we get introduced to Steve, Steve is already aware of the lies that Michael told in the past, and that's why he's a problem. When it comes right 
down to it, the only person who doesn't really know what's going on is Trevor, and it's more because he was lied to in the past rather than being lied to now with new lies. But when you think about it, even Trevor is to some degree in on the lie. While he doesn't know the whole truth, he does know that Michael is still alive and that he faked his death. The game is ultimately about one big lie that Michael told a long time ago and the consequences of that. I think, if anything, the person that Michael lies to the most is himself. As he says to Jimmy, I always thought I was the good guy, when he clearly wasn't. Michael's journey in GT5 is about his past coming back to haunt him and him growing as a person to understand himself and move beyond his past failings. For him to learn what truly matters in life, and his finishing by saying that the character deaths at the end are caused by these building of lies? Like, what are you talking about? Like, take ending B, for example. Devin Weston goes up to Franklin and says, Hey, I hate Michael's guts. If you kill him, I'll protect you and solve your other problems. What on earth does any of that have to do with any lie Michael has ever told? Devin knows nothing about any of Michael's prior lies. He knows nothing about his history, the faking of to death, the North Yankton, none of that stuff. Devin just hates Michael in large part because of all the stuff related to the movie studio. Like, Michael just acts against his interests, has nothing to do with any building of white lies into black lies. What's funny is that I don't disagree with the premise that Rockstar likely uses particular songs in their trailers for a reason. It is certainly possible in the second trailer for GT5 that the song was chosen to make references to Michael. Even though the trailer isn't specifically about Michael, so it'd be weird if the song was specifically about him, but nevertheless, we can look at the song. Skeletons in your closet itching to come outside. This could reference Michael's past as a bank robber, all the crimes, the murders, and all that stuff that he did. And then of course the corrupt deal that he made with Dave to give him a new life, to push that stuff away from him, hide it in a closet, so to speak. In the story, there are itching to come outside, Michael wanting to get back into the game, him missing that life, Trevor coming back and Steve finding out about that corrupt deal, messing with your conscience in a way your face can't hide. He's literally in therapy. A man who talks about how Michael lays around getting drunk, feeling guilty about his past. The trailer skips the next part and moves on to here. What did your mama tell you about lies? She said it wasn't polite to tell a white one. What did your daddy tell you about lies? He said one white lie turns into a black one. This of course could reference Michael's earlier criminal career, which of course he would need to have lied continuously to maintain. There are references to him and Trevor having multiple different identities, for example. All these white lies eventually leading him to the one big black lie that is the center of GTA 5 that he seeks to maintain, that being his deal with Dave and faking his death. So it's getting ready to blow, it's getting ready to show. Somebody shot off at the mouth and we're getting ready to know. It's getting ready to drop, it's getting ready to shock. Somebody done turned up the heater and it's all getting ready to pop. Which could reference again everything we discussed before at the beginning, how there's so many different avenues seeking to bring Michael's past back into the present. So clearly I have a host of videos that cover the story of GTA 5 far better than I do in this video. But again, surely you can see the humor in a channel releasing a video where they purport to be lore experts to the degree that they can understand the entire story of an unreleased game based on a trailer, when they're not even equipped or knowledgeable enough to understand a story that released 10 years ago, where they even got something wrong that has been a meme for years. I am just not a fan of channels talking about topics and things that they only have an interest in because they're popular. Will this be my last video on the game, Ferris? Well, if they continue to cover GTA and continue to do this low level of research when making such videos, uh, probably not.